Okay, uh, we might as well kick off then. Uh, so hi, and uh, welcome to optimizing Chocolatey Packages for Others. To start off, who am I? Um, you may have actually seen me around the place. Uh, I'm James Ruskin, and I'm currently employed by Chocolatey Software as a senior solutions engineer. Um, on Tuesdays at least, I moonlight as a community moderator on the Chocolatey community repository, and despite being a pretty long-term user of it, uh, I uh, was surprised at how much I actually didn't know about how it worked behind the scenes when I was just using it recreationally. And some of the frequently asked questions we see on Discord and other community uh, input um, suggest that other people don't know either, and that kind of inspired this talk. Finally, I've maintained chocolate packages, both as a part of my job uh, for many years, and more recently for fun. Uh, if you want to chat about any of this afterwards, by the way, you can find me around the conference or at various places online. Um, so what is this optimistically titled talk actually going to cover? First off, we're going to run through what a cho the Jocity Community Repository is. Um, we're going to cover what actually happens when a package is pushed to the Jocity Community Repository. We're going to demonstrate how to create a package that you might want to push to the community CCR or any other repository that you control. And for what it's worth, I'm going to be writing Jocity Community Repository as CCR because it's really lengthy and doesn't fit on a small resolution often. Um, we're going to cover how you might want to modify those packages for best interacting with package internalizer, and how you actually might want to modify things for easy updates of packages um, when you're automating them. Just to cover all the bases, uh, although I suspect just about everyone in here knows, um, we're going to quickly cover what Chocolatey is. <laughs> so uh, what is Chocolatey? Chocolatey is a package manager for Windows. It's similar to Apt, uh, Homebrew, or Yum. And when it was first created, there was nothing like it around. It can be used for just about anything uh, due to it using PowerShell under the hood. So we, and as we can all appreciate, PowerShell is brilliant for automating stuff on Windows platforms. It's supported on Windows 8.1 and up, and Windows Server 2008 R2 in Azure and up, although we're going to pretend for here it's 2012 and up, because just in Azure, that, that's a little trickier. And though it works on Windows 7 with a little bit of fiddling, uh, you do need to jump through some hoops to actually get that working, uh, mostly around TLS. So that said, what's the community repository? Uh, it's a publicly available um, repository of community-maintained chocolatey packages that you can go and browse through at uh, community.chocolatey.org. Um, if you haven't been on the work in a while, actually, it's just had a refresh um, by Steph Hayes, our resident magic wielder for design, and it looks great. Um, it contains some 9,900-odd packages uh, when I had a look earlier, though the number is increasing all the time. And of course, even though that's the number of unique packages, we have a variety of versions. We've also got over 2 billion downloads um, and have even overwhelmed a standard int, though let's not talk about how we know that. So that's a lot of unique packages. Um, it's all enabled on all community, sorry, all Chocolatey CLI installations by default. And it's the default source Chocolatey we actually use. We allow anyone until proven guilty to publish packages with a few conditions. And that's pending, but that's pending verification and review by automated and volunteer moderators. Uh, processes and volunteer moderators. But what actually happens when a package is pushed to the repository? For that, we're going to turn over to the arduous adventures of Penny Package and the tale of trials and tribulations on her journey to the Chocolatey repository. As you can tell, I'm not actually employed as an artist by Chocolatey, and lucky for you, I'm not actually going all in on uh, the idea to do a children's storybook. But what happens to your bright-eyed package when it's pushed to the CCR? To put it in short, there's a series of automated inspections, uh, the potential requirement for intervention, and for untrusted packages, an inspection by a human moderator. So, any questions? Thank you for coming to my talk. We've probably got a few minutes. Uh, but no, I, I do come in under generally, so I apologize if I rush. Do please tell me to slow down, by the way. I didn't mention that earlier. Um, but let's actually go into some more detail. The first step packages go through when they're pushed with the CCR is package validation. If you've uh, built a package before from a template or from scratch, you're probably going to have to have dealt with a new spec file. This is an XML file contained within each package uh, that's nearly what NuGet uses, though it's been extended in a few ways for chocolatey packages. 
you'll, uh, the automated rules here, uh, actually there's around 70 of them, maybe more at this point, um, run against each package after submission, making sure that links to documentation and source are present and working. And there's a description, non-functional chunks of <laughs> the template code have been removed, which we're gonna come back to in a second. Uh, popular files that shouldn't be there, for example, git ignore, um, aren't included. Uh, it's probably not supposed to be there if you have pushed it. And that the various scripts pass muster. Checksums are also used if appropriate, all that sort of thing. These are classes requirements, guidelines, and suggestions. From definite necessities before approval down to things we just prefer were corrected if we notice them, but won't be blocked. So that's a whole lot of details. Uh, oh, sorry, there is a whole lot of details. Uh, at that uh, link at the bottom of this uh, slide, um, if you were interested in seeing more about them. After that, we verify the package, which, well, as you know, packages generally install something, configure something, or drop something, some kind of helpful file onto your system. We install and uninstall the package on a pretty temporary Vagrant machine and upload the logs to a gist. This should expose undeclared prerequisites as they should be linked, listed as package dependencies or installed as part of the package. Um, and I'm happy to say that the real Josh King has actually upgraded our verifier VM recently to 2019, which has Im helped improve the amount of packages needing to be manually verified. Um, once again, even more information on what happened there is available at the link at the bottom. If all that succeeds, we move on to checking the package for malware or other negatively associated file types. We submit it to VirusTotal where possible and react accordingly. If all files within are, and downloaded by the package are given a clean bill of health by each of the many security vendors, it can proceed. And the files are shown with uh, scan results on the CCR page. Again, we'll show that in a second. Uh, otherwise, we have a few different things that can actually happen depending on how many flat files are flagged or rather how many detec detections there are. Uh, if you see here on the slide, uh, it, we basically say if there's one to four detections for the entire package, then there's a notified and we'll suggest that you might want to think about installing it, but in general, you should be fine. Uh, any package with five plus detections from the 95, it's gonna require a moderator before it'll pass through anything else. Obviously, false positives can happen. And some interesting packages are generated in ways that are similar to viruses or other malware. <laughs> for example, uh, installers generated with certain Python tools, script exe generated binaries, and of course, tools used for crypto. At the same time as other automated tests or sooner, we compare the submitted package to the closest matching approving, approved version if that exists, so we can display a diff of the package to the moderators and, and any other signed in users. This isn't actually entirely obvious, but if you sign in, you can see all the diffs and information there. For most packages, this should be as simple as just an update to a link or binary and the checksum that is associated with that. I'm actually far too excited about this one, although you might be able, not be able to tell from the way I'm not speeding up, um, because it was the first moderation service written in quite some time, and I had a great time last year writing it with uh, Gary Ewan Park. Hopefully at some point, this data can be used for further automation, uh, though there's, often, uh, there's obviously a lot to consider there. We'll touch on this in the examples. If that all looks good, and sometimes even before that, a volunteer will review the scripts and package. I should stress the word volunteer. Uh, the team is an absolutely fantastic bunch of folk who've seen countless packages, but in the absence of some grand machine learning project or Choco GPT that knows PowerShell intimately, there's an unfortunate bottleneck due to the importance of Q slash review life balance. Moderators like The Cake Is Now, Pascal Berger, M. Kevin R, um, FLCDRG, this is always interesting where I get to the pronunciation of people. Uh, Virtualix, uh, Vex32, Paul Portwit, Gary Ewan Park again, the real Josh King, and Kim Nordmo put in a load of time and love into making sure that the queue doesn't jump into terribly scary numbers. But they don't have all the, world, the time in the world to do it, and everything else they do at the same time. So somebody reviews the scripts and packages following the guidelines that I've linked again at the bottom of the slide just to ensure that they're not messily invoking some nightmarish base64 encoded mess, downloading files from megauploadbin.com or some source that isn't the obvious original provider, um, duplicating another package, a bit contentious that one, and the binaries, et cetera, aren't included if there isn't a straight up, uh, an easy distribution license easily available or shown in some other form. For example, you can actually email the original provider, um, be authorized to do so, and then provide that as the license. 
So there might be some back and forth here um, as new packages adjust their code and metadata appropriately and repush non-approved versions until it looks good to everyone. Though for those that don't, packages that have been pushed back for requested changes enter a bit of a limbo. The maintainer is notified um, of any messages or requested changes and the package sits in the queue in a waiting state. There's a service that we run, Package Cleaner, um, that actually goes through and cleans up packages that have been sitting there for too long. They get automatically rejected until requested otherwise by the maintainer. A sort of stale bot, if you will. Anyway, assuming that all goes well, the package is approved and ready for download by the public. Though there is one more thing that happens, which is just a package cacher. We store binaries in a private CDN so that packages that are installed years after should, uh, the creation of the package should still succeed. I'm sure we've all encountered some kind of Microsoft package or link where the download link cycles every few years, changes a GUID in the middle of it, and or just you know gets removed from a website. Or with Adobe or Chrome packages where they provide a single link without a version in it, <coughs> excuse me, and um, you can't get a given version later on. Our cache CDN tries to mitigate these issues, as well as being a first line of defense against supply chain security uh, and, and, and other such things. So, let's have a look at some packages and talk about some good practices. So from the top then, uh, I'm going to assume that everyone here has probably created a chocolatey package before. Has anybody not done so? Okay. <laughs> well, um, I, I'll, I'll run through uh, from the top then, uh, but uh, just please know that you can create packages from scratch uh, and by using things like Choco New, which will produce a skeletal uh, outline of the package that you'll require into which you can drop your binaries, your files, whatever you want, and then adjust the script appropriately. Um, so what we can see here is we can just create our package very quickly. Uh, and this supports, this default template supports pretty much everything that you would expect Jopity supports support. Um, it does have a lot of uh, additional code in there though. Let's just take away the terminal. Because as you can see, it supports just about anything. Whatever you want to do, whatever you feel like you might need to do, it's probably in here. And you're on the hook to remove the stuff that isn't relevant. Um, there is actually a to-do uh, and a, uh, a selection of comments in there to suggest how you can go about this and the, the order you should do it. But when you get down to it, Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's all here. Um, as I said earlier, we do see a surprising amount of uh, packages that are pushed, that shot, uh, the CCR, that have a lot of these comments still in, that have things like the EXE, MSI, or MSU still specified. So you can see here that this is very much a catch-all. The file type parameter actually requires EXE, MSI, or MSU, or any of the other similar things. Uh, and as the comment suggests, it should only be one of them. However, people don't often always check. This is sad, but something that does just happen. So to reduce the amount of changes and additional stuff you might need to remove, you can use a custom template. We have a lot of these. Uh, and I'm hoping I have already installed one here. Yep. Nope. Yes, um, and you can you know you drill into that and see that there is a lot of information applied there, anyway, uh, provided there. Or I could in a previous version.
So we can draw on the information provided. By info. and see a list of parameters you can provide, the files that are included, and, and a bunch of other information. You can also have a look at any, a list of available packages that are on the Chocolatey community repository. Or you could, if I'd connect to the internet. Are there any questions while I am fixing my issues? Okay. So let's give them another go. So you see there are at least some other templates here. Um, and it's really easy to then specify that you want to use, uh, it's really easy to A, install other templates, and B, if you want to use a different template, then it's very easy to use it by just simply specifying the template argument. We can see that this is, though still full of comments and useful bits, less so. Comparing the two directly would show fewer things. <laughs> um, and the install, before modify and uninstall files are all much cut down. So, much easier to add to. So that's a good way to get started, just running Choco New, optionally with a template, uh, and adding your chosen files in place. Uh, following any instructions, and then testing it. We'd also have a couple of required tricks around stuff like package internalizer and how to get along with that nicely. It's generally an awesome tool, but uh, there are a few small issues where, which we've tried to fix up that aren't always released. Uh, so to start off, um, if you're, uh, there's a mild issue with an over-enthusiastic regex match um, that will take anything that looks vaguely like a URL and attempt to download it. Uh, this obviously fails if you have things like a string HTTPS, um, as I said, over-enthusiastic. Um, so if you want to get around something like this, uh, which was something that was failing in one of our packages, uh, you should adjust it to not match HTTPS. It looks a little strange, but it does work. Uh, sadly, my fix for that was not accepted, but I am told it will be fixed at some point in the near future, which is good. Um, in terms of importing functions from other files, if you have, uh, for example, a function file within a Chocolatey package, um, something to consider is if you are using a dot sourcing method and straight up PSL1 files, the way that package internalizer, internalizer interacts with script blocks can throw an error if your script is malformed in any way. Uh, something to consider then there is, well, I personally recommend you should use import module and a valid PSM1 file where appropriate. This works a lot better. Um, running away from that then, we'll talk about how to optimize packages for updates. So if you've been around the Chocolatey Packages community at all, you've probably heard of a module called AU. Um, it's a popular module that's used by, exclusively almost, by the automatic packages within Chocolatey Community, Chocolatey Packages. Um, which is a giant repository, uh, which I have a link here. Giant repository, absolutely full of 
packages that are automatically updated and pushed to the Chocolate repository with a very regular app player job. Uh, so most of those are being updated automatically in this, and then there are others that are manual. And you can see that there are a vast swathe of commits, although that is off mostly uh, based on the commits made by the automatic jobs. As I say, most of they, them are using AU, um, but as that the maintainer of AU has dropped it uh, vaguely recently, it's now been forked by again by the chocolate community, uh, and you'll hopefully see some updates to the module newly named Chocolatey AU at some point in the future. So if we drill down into that 7-zip automatic package, uh, we'd be able to say, see an update script like this. And this is a great source of examples for how you would write a package update script if you were to do so. Uh, obviously this one is specifically for 7-zip, but the lessons learned here can be applied just about anywhere. AU actually relies on a series of globally defined functions uh, that run in series when you call it. Um, so in this example, we have a before update, which is run every time before you actually call the update and is generally used to source the files for um, packaging or, or similar things. And, and then uh, post update, it just runs through a given file, through a given file and replaces things in there. So you can see that you would have a bunch of stuff come out in a hash table and then you would replace things based on that later. If you have a look at the install script that's paired with that, you can see that there is some consideration for 32-bit versus 64-bit. Obviously, Chocolate does handle 30, uh, x86 and x64 stuff separately, but there is some issue with shimming. Uh, if you have this, uh, two binaries named the same thing, it's not gonna work nicely, so you'll have to handle that separately here. If you didn't want to use AU, because it is slightly contentious, then you might want to write a standalone updates script, which is gonna look roughly similar. Obviously, you're gonna go through, you're going to find out what the latest release is and what the latest available package is. Um, I would recommend short circuiting at this point if you find that there's no work to be done, as this will save you a lot of time on runners or other uh, costs there. Uh, you should update your install script. Uh, package the, up the updated files. Uh, and one interesting thing here is that we're providing a version. So though we haven't updated the new spec at all, and the new spec version is very much out of date, uh, we will simply provide version to Jocko Pack, and it will update all of that on its own. Uh, but the update script will be updated there. And just calling back to the package differ stuff earlier, we would recommend trying to keep URLs, checksums, et cetera, as clear as possible so that they can be analyzed appropriately. In, in the diff, when, you're, when a moderator is looking at the thing, uh, it makes it a lot easier for them to judge and potentially easier for automation later. When that comes up, uh, well, as you can see here, Hopefully nothing more reverse than a version and file info will have changed. But when it does happen, uh, when you do push there, you can see that you can see all of the data here to show what actually happened during the validation process uh, and any failures that might have occurred. Oh, this is quite an old one now. So,
actually time for a few questions. <laughs> Sorry. So from uh, an appearing in the repository perspective versus freely available to the public, yeah. um, you're looking at several slightly different numbers. Um, from the moment you've pushed it, it's available on the repository. However, uh, it won't be available to anybody who just wants to install it. You'll have to uh, specify a version, otherwise it won't show up. So from that perspective, almost zero time. Um, from a, an approved, got through the process, available to the public perspective, you're possibly looking at several weeks uh, or more. It really goes back to, again, that moderators are volunteers and volunteers have lives, and we're not going to try and yeah. steal their lives. Sorry. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Sorry. Ah, yes, something else I should mention. Yeah. When, when you're not in the pushing back and forth, um, it, it does become a lot easier. And there is a further thing where a package that is reputable, that has been pushed many times in a row and is from somebody that is trusted, um, can be, has a, a trusted package um, status applied to it. And at that point, it will flow through almost straight away. Yes? Uh, so the question was for things like Google Chrome, Firefox, and I'm sorry, I should have repeated your question as well, uh, and the like, is it the same? Because there is possibly a single link without version. So uh, the question is essentially, is there a problem with that, or is there a, yeah? Um, so there is uh, a bit of a mismatch, if you will, potentially between the installed software and the package that has been installed and wrapped around it. Um, obviously, yes, if you update the software without using Chocolatey, then that will end up with your package and um, software being out of sync. Uh, there are some ways to get around that, but it's fun. Um, Essentially, yeah, you, you may find that if you don't use something like uh, an internalized package, which is something you can set up for a company or some, something along those lines, if you host your own repository, though we can't redistribute the Chrome binary within the package, um, what you can do later is you can take that package, internalize the binary so it is the correct version, and then have that stored for yourself, or put the binary somewhere else and reference that instead of the external location. Um, if you do do that, then it will always work and you'll always end up with the right version being installed at the point of package. But again, you might go out of date if you then have an auto update that's happening in the background. Did that cover the question or? I feel like I went. Okay, sorry, I worried I went a bit off track there. Okay. Anything else from anybody else? Um, so, it was originally owned by Magicinator. Um, he has archived uh, the repository for the AU module itself. Um, and I believe he's not interested in doing any further work on it. Uh, but I haven't spoken to him about that. Um, we've forked it into Chocolatey Community. Uh, and I've submitted two PRs in the last few weeks at least. We're going to change the name when we actually release it. But of course, getting everybody to use that separate name is going to be a bit of an ongoing thing. So if we find bugs, that's obviously going to be prioritized. My two PRs were somewhat vanity related, if anything. Um, but we're, the community will be taking responsibility for the module. Um, I think Chocolatey are going to be publishing it. So. so the question, as I'm going to repeat it, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is that a lot of vendors lock downloads behind uh, pay, well, not paywalls, but uh, registration walls or the like. Has anybody put together a tools or documentation on how to convince them otherwise? Yes. I haven't seen that, but I now really want to do it. <laughs> um, doesn't help now, but maybe give me a few weeks or months or something. Um, because yeah, as, as, as far as I'm aware, there are no resources currently. Um, I know I've spoken to various vendors about this sort of thing. And mixed results. Sorry. Did you have a question a second? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Uh, there is both a tool called Package Builder, um, which actually me and Stevie Coaster are going to be demonstrating in this room. That is based on the Chocolate for Business stuff, um, so not open source in this case. Um, there are also other tools. Uh, I believe the Cake is Now has a couple of resources for doing similar things. Yeah, so. Yeah, in, in general, the, the differentiation between open source and our business offering is that. 
with open source. If you're willing to code it yourself, more power to you. You can almost certainly do just about anything in the world. Um, but we are trying to help people get to their business goals with the business stuff. So we have tools that will do that. They are currently paid for. Um, Stevie has some fun stuff. If you mentioned a web-based uh, interface for this, he's uh, played with Universal Dashboard and the tools that we provide. So you can essentially drag and drop an EXE or provide a link, and it will spit out a package. But again, not helpful without a. <laughs> We've seen a couple of things from ChatGPT. And um, so the question was, uh, can I talk a little more open-endedly about internalizing packages uh, and how one might uh, write automation to internalize packages that you want? Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, again, going back to the, let's see if I can bring up the, no, nope, not going to do it. Uh, so again, going back to where we had, uh, for example, the Chocolate Community, Chocolate Packages, um, repository or any other repository that contains the information. So if you if often if you go to a specific package, um, then it will have a package source link. Uh, something you can do there is you can take go and look at the source code for that. Uh, and even if it is a package that does not have distribution rights that we can host freely on CCR, you as an end user um, can internalize that package. So you can take that exact same uh, code that is used to source the version grab the link to the thing, and then upload that package to the CCR, and you can make a package that will do the same thing but internalize the binary. And because it's for you, you don't have to worry quite so much. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I'd, I'd probably say just because I suspect not everyone, people might prefer to hear about open source in this uh, talk. Um, if you do want to hear more about the Chocolate for Business offerings, I'd suggest coming back here at, I think, 4 o'clock. Oh, yes, I see what you mean. So yeah, and uh, we also provide scripts to allow folk to uh, we also provide scripts to allow folk to um, basically have automated pipelines. Uh, we do do that as part of our environments, but uh, we have published most of them publicly uh, in the QDE. Oh, we're in QDE, interesting. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but yeah, we do have some Jenkins jobs that actually have examples of all the uh, scripting that you would require to run that as a job and then have that happen. Um, yeah. Then I will, I think, wrap it up. Um, so in summary, packages can take a bit of time to get through the queue, and I am sorry about that. Um, though you may have some amazing skills in PowerShell, as with aliases, if you do want to share your code, it is best to write it legibly. That way, if you write things with common good practices in a way that is readable to everybody, um, it's more likely to be approved more quickly uh, as it takes less effort for people to understand on the way through. Uh, regularly submitting good packages means that you may be trusted, as mentioned again, uh, which will further expedite the process unless you trigger some issue with scanner or something along those lines. If you want to chat about any of this, um, we're going to be about all of these chaps and me. Uh, and uh, you can find us on the community Discord, which is linked there at ch0.co slash community, or with that QR code. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Um, don't forget to fill out your surveys. Uh, and again, please do come find me if you have any more things you'd like to chat about, community, uh, about Chocolatey, the community repository, or just about anything else. And as I said, Stevie and I will be back in here around 3 or 3.15 um, to demonstrate the business side.